Hello folks, welcome back to World War II TV and the first of a double bill today. And this show is the last of the three about operations that didn't actually take place. Then tonight when Kyle Glover is on, it's an operation that did take place. And then tomorrow with Gavin Mortimer, that is also operations and raids that did take place. So I hope you watched the show yesterday with Joseph Quinn about Operation Green the potential uh, idea of the Germans to invade Ireland either as a feint or as part of Operation Sea Lion, because that was really good and raised some interesting questions, some of which we'll be kind of tackling again in today's show. So today's guest, David O'Keefe, has been summoned up. I have said Enigma three times, and he has been brought down from afar to join us today. But we're not specifically talking about Dieppe, although it will come up, because uh, Enigma and Pinch Raids will. So we are looking at uh, an operation, one of Ian Fleming's ideas. And basically what we're going to look at is at what point does an idea become a plan? At what point along, uh, you know, two military officers or three officers sitting in a pub having a uh, a discussion about what they could do. When does that idea actually become an operation? And at what point do we classify it as something that might have happened? So to look at this and unravel it for it, David O'Keefe is going to join us now. So it's early morning for you in Canada. So good morning, David. How are you today? Well, good morning, Woody. Oh, I'm doing well here. We had a little bit of snow this week, which is always a nice surprise in April. Wow. Um, yeah. So hence the reason I'm wearing the sweater and the jacket and everything else. So that's it. But how are things over there with you? They're very good. Normandy is nice and busy again this year. So, you know, when, when we when you've been on previously talking about Dieppe, you know, as we I'm gonna hold up a copy of your book. Anybody who has not yet bought one day in August, the links to it are in the description below. It is not just about Dieppe, it's about the whole concept of the Allies needing to find solutions to breaking the German codes and what was happening early in the war, mid-war, and indeed after Dieppe. So the pinch raid idea, Ian Fleming comes into this. So remind us. Um, in 1940, where the British are, you know, in, in their understanding of, of the intelligence war. And then I'll let you kind of carry on with your PowerPoint. But kind of give us a summary of, of where we are a few months into the war. Well, essentially, by the time that we pick up this story, which is the late summer of 1940, uh, Bletchley Park has been in existence, of course, for a couple of years, and they are trying to make headway on all forms of Enigma. Now, at this point, there's only a three-rotor Enigma, which is tough enough to crack, about 150 million, million, million to one, or like odds without captured material or some sort of electrical mechanical machine like the bomber, which they would eventually create. And of course, um, they have been trying trying to break it unsuccessfully up until this point. They've had some success with the air and land, but have had no success whatsoever with naval enigma. And so as a result, as you'll see in a couple of seconds, there is an increasing level of desperation that is taking hold at Bletchley within the Admiralty, within naval intelligence, and indeed right up on um, you know uh, right up to churchill's cabinet so that's kind of where we are and i'll get into depth a little bit more when we start the powerpoint yeah exactly and you know the, the, it all ties in, in with the, the the battle of the atlantic which is yeah. is is important in 1940 and beyond the battle of britain is or has been raging or will be raging when 1940 starts the british army come back from dunkirk as we've discussed a lot on this channel the, the 1940 era is very interesting but we tend to focus on those kind of high spot spots of the battle of britain and certain major days on the calendar but this ongoing intelligence war which doesn't necessarily have these set days where things are happening often kind of gets lost a bit in these days of momentous activity and so you know th this work that is going on behind the scenes never stops not not through not throughout world war ii and and it, it is in its particular kind of crucial period in 1940 and indeed the next couple of years it's still crucial i suppose only beyond about 1943 do things calm down a little bit um but i'll, I'll put the powerpoint up on screen so we've got it there and um you're going to take us through operation right. ruthless which is yeah. um, this, this exciting um operation that that may that didn't happen but might have done well, we'll see. We'll see by the end. I'll lay, I'll lay it out and I'll let you decide at the end. Now, um, probably if anybody's ever looked into Ian Fleming, you've probably heard about Operation Ruthless. And the way it's always been portrayed historically was that Operation Ruthless was sort of the flight of Fleming fancy. How's that for an alliteration? 
Um, in other words, it was something that, you know, he cocked up. He was, uh, you know, he was, he was talking at the top of his hat. He was being extremely creative, but of course, way over the top to the point where would anybody now sitting back years later would take a look at it and go, <laughs> yeah, okay, this didn't go up. This didn't happen. This didn't, you know, occur. This is something that, you know, his typical James Bond imagination sort of, you know, created at that time. Well, the story, as you will see, is a bit different. And of course, going back to what we had discussed before, the context of 1940. Now, remember, for the Royal Navy, they never had any uh, or took any serious thought or had any serious thought about France and Holland and Belgium completely collapsing, let alone the Germans taking all of Norway in their pre-war planning. So as a result, by the time we get to September 1940, where all this starts, Operation Ruthless, um, the British now have a huge task on their hands, not only maintaining the entire the sea lanes for the entire empire, but now instead of just um, basically keeping the Germans hemmed up where they did in the First World War, basically in the North Sea area, now they have to worry about German vessels all the way from the top of Norway, all the way down to the coast of Spain and the Bay of Biscay. So as a result now, the British are stretched and they are desperately looking for any possible way or magic elixir that they can use to offset the fact that they are being stretched. So in other words, you know, it's kind of like insider trading we've talked about before when you have something like ultra and, and uh, cryptography. The idea is you know where to hedge your bets. You can make calculated as opposed to blind risks. And of course, that was very important in the late summer and early fall of 1940, because of course you have the possible threat of Operation Sea Lion. Now, of course, but, you know, if we look back at it now, there was likely no way the Germans were ever going to do this, but the perception in England was very strong that this could hit at any time. And of course, following the massive you know, disaster that turned out to be the miracle of Dunkirk, the evacuation, the British do escape with the French in large numbers, but without heavy equipment. So the British, of course, are up against it, to say the least. Also, this is the height of the Battle of Britain where the Germans, of course, are, have now switched from hitting various RAF locations or RAF bases along the coast and convoys, and they're now starting to bomb London. So we're at a very difficult time in British history. The British are thinking about mass evacuations. They're moving their gold reserves out. They're moving their cultural reserves like the Magna Carta, sneaking that across to North America. So they are preparing for perhaps the worst. So this is where Operation Ruthless is born, out of this kind of desperation. And of course, at Bletchley Park, and we talked about this a couple of seconds ago, um, they, there's also a sense of desperation, because despite the fact that they've had some success with the air and uh, army enigma, they are bumping their heads against the wall when it comes to the naval and as i said at this point there's only the three rotor naval in a, a, a three rotor enigma in existence whose odds are 150 million 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 to one to break into without any captured material now the two men that are probably most associated with this at the time the one on the left of course everybody knows by now who's alan turing um, but the one on the right is somebody who is extremely important in naval section during the Second World War, naval section at Bletchley Park, and um, plays a central role in the ultra historiography. In other words, how we understand, well, what the impact was of ultra and its impact in history later on. His name was Frank Birch, and Birch was a World War I um, Room 40 veteran. They were the ones doing the cryptography in World War I under the legendary Blinker Hall. And of course, by World War II, he was the head of um, the naval section at Bletchley that coordinated the efforts of men like Turing. So he was the one who was extremely vocal. He was the one that did all of the, you know, the, the liaisoning between Bletchley and all these services. And of course, you know, MI5, MI6, the government, et cetera. His archives, which, and they're not necessarily his per se, but the Bletchley Park archives, um, which are in the National Archives in Great Britain, are a treasure trove because he kept 
all of his memorandum, his correspondence, etc. And it's fascinating when you go through it to actually see what was on the minds of those at Bletchley at that time. And of course, as you can see on the right, there were three main ways of sort of speeding up the process. Because yes, eventually, you know, brilliant cryptographers or brilliant minds like Turing and Twin and Alexander um, would eventually come to the conclusion. But when you're in a world at war where, with a pending German invasion and bombs raining down on you, you don't have time to wait for genius to kick in. You need to speed up genius. In other words, I've said this before, it's kind of like getting cheats in a video game. You want to get to the end as quick as possible. So in this particular case, there were three different possibilities. One was, you know, treachery, treason, espionage, what we would now call human intelligence. Another one was the cryptographic method. In other words, allowing Turing, Twin, and the rest of the guys to go, you know, to go nuts and be able to solve it intellectually. And then, of course, there was captured material or pinching, as we have discussed in the past. So these were the three possibilities. And traditionally, you kind of mix them. But by this particular point, it was really number two and number three, which were the keys to success and breaking the backlog at Bletchley. Now, what they were looking for, of course, were what were called A-list target materials. A lot of people think that just capturing the machine itself um, gives you you know, the, the key to everything. That's not necessarily the truth because you can figure out how a machine works. You can retrofit one, you can build one and you can play with it. What's really key is trying to figure out with the Enigma. The Enigma is kind of like a layer cake where it's set up in a different way every single day. And to understand how to set it up, you need a series of key sheets, setting sheets, etc., that tell you from day to day, and you can see them in the upper right, how to actually do this. So those were considered to be uh, A1 targets. So if you're going to pinch material, it's the key sheets that you really want, the key sheets, the setting sheets, um, or if you can capture a machine that is full set up and in its pristine settings for that day, because the standard operating procedure was A, try to destroy the machine, but if you couldn't, remove all the plugs, spin the rotors, etc. Kind of like a combination lock where you just spin it. That's what the Germans were told to do in cases of emergency. So the idea was if you could actually capture one with the plug settings, all the plugs in the proper spaces, the rotors all set perfectly, that would be a first class indication or a first class kick into the door, if you will, for the cryptographers. Failing that, obviously, you wanted to get your hands on the books. But there were a lot of other ways of getting in the back door. One of them, and a lot of people don't realize this, that the Enigma tended to break down quite a bit. And so as a result, there was always a, rever um, a reserve hand cipher. And this was known as the RHV codebook. And this didn't change on a regular basis the way the other material did. So that was kind of a nice little cheat to have if you could get your hands on this one. And then, of course, there were other things like E-bars and B-bars and weather codes. These are short signals that were used in emergency situations. And then, of course, you have the general cipher for the Kriegsmarine and the dockyard cipher. A lot of people don't realize how important the dockyard cipher was because that would give sort of the, the comings and goings in each one of the German naval bases throughout the you know the the german scheme of things and it was rudimentary stuff you know generally speaking but it was enough to give you cribs in other words kind of like when we're all doing wordle right now or we're all doing crosswords where if you have a couple of letters um it'll certainly speed up the process well that's what the material in front of you was designed to do so this is really what bletchley park was looking to get their hands and on. just to jump in quickly david yeah. i think that's an aspect that the general public and some of the viewers, you know, even Michael itself included, we kind of forget that Enigma is a package that the Germans are using. It's not just the machine. It is this, the code books and the data and the key sheets and information. And without, without that, without the operators having this information, they can't use Enigma, but it therefore is giving the allies the possibility, however um, unlikely, that if they can get in and get a machine and all the associated paperwork, as you say there, it's, it's, it's a really really quick way of going right in the heart of it and kind of not bypassing but but um overtaking the, the, the cryptography yep. behind the scenes 
Yeah, it's what Frank Birch called the whole bag of tricks. And this is what he was arguing for. He was arguing for any type of pinch operation. And of course, he didn't feel that he could suggest the means. He just basically told the Navy, look, this is what we need. And what ideally we would like a machine fully set up the way it's supposed to be. Failing that, of course, we want the code books. We want the setting sheets, et cetera. All that would be perfect. And if we can get that, we can actually start almost real-time decryption. So you can imagine how powerful that would be when Great Britain is hanging on by its fingernails in 1940. And like I said before, you've got bombs raining down. You've got Luftwaffe raids every night. You're worried about Operation Sea Lion. To be able to have the ability of decrypting your enemy's messages in real time would be absolute gold when it comes to you know, fighting the battle. Um, <clears throat> what he was suggesting, what Birch was suggesting, was to target the vessels that you see in front of you, or at least these types of vessels. And basically, they were M-boats, R-boats, S-boats, uh, various trawlers, air, sea, rescue, and salvage vessels. Now, all of them were now um, at work in the English Channel. And that's basically where the focus was. They were looking at the English Channel and they started tracking the English Channel since the fall of France. This is something, of course, that I, I alluded to in my book on Dieppe because basically by the time they arrive at Dieppe, they've got two years of studying you know, the patterns of the, of the German Kriegsmarine in the English Channel, their communications, what is located where. Uh, they really start building up quite the intelligence profile on where to find the various targets that they're looking for. But that all starts with Birch reaching out. And he starts reaching out in early September of 1940. And when he does, he ends up reaching out to Ian Fleming. Now, of course, I should probably give you a little bit of background. Why Ian Fleming? Of course, we always know him as you know, the James Bond author who came to fame afterwards, but there was a lot more to Fleming. And that's one of the arguments I've made in my book um, is trying to really get a sober assessment of who Fleming was in this period between 39 and 42. Um, again, and I've said this before, he's not James Bond, not by any stretch, but he's not a faceless bureaucrat either who talks at the top of his hat. This was somebody who was brought into naval intelligence specifically by the director of naval intelligence, John Godfrey, in 1939, after it is claimed he was working for MI6, um, basically on the Russian beat, working for MI6, and part of his cover was working as a stockbroker and a journalist during the 1930s. I'm not sure if that's ever been confirmed, but it certainly seems likely, um, because it would be very difficult for him to make that you know, that that massive uh, leap from simply a stockbroker and a journalist to the assistant to the director of naval intelligence, unless he had an intelligence background. So by 1939, he is now running what is called Section 17, and he is also the personal assistant to the director of naval intelligence. And of course, part of his uh, portfolio, and I say part, and you'll see his entire portfolio in a minute, is pinch operations. Um, he is the one who was chosen, likely because he's an extremely Machiavellian and creative, or Machiavellian character who has a creative mind. And that's exactly the type of character you need to pull off these operations. Well, in addition to pinch operations, he's also the liaison with MI6, the liaison with MI5, and of course, the political warfare executive, Bletchley Park, to say the least. Um, and of course, also with the JIC, uh, the Ministry of Economic Warfare, the Inner Services Topographical Department, which was John Godfrey's baby, which did all the planning, the initial planning for combined operations. A lot of people don't realize that. And of course, the liaison to the Americans as well, the FBI, the OSS, and the Office of Naval Intelligence. So you can see that Fleming is um, not a lightweight, to say the least. Again, not James Bond, but he cannot be dismissed anymore. And I think there's been an active um, um, attempt to basically downplay his importance over the years, um, uh, partly because of jealousy, partly because I think he had a wicked sense of humor and liked to push the envelope. 
um, when it came to his writing. And I think there was a lot of times where he treaded on some really valuable secrets and security issues when he was writing uh, his books. As a matter mm -hmm. of fact, of course, if you read, uh, if, if you understand the Dieppe operation, you understand how important the Hotel Modern and the Les Arcades Hotel are. Well, they make their appearance in Goldfinger. And he talks about them being side by side, just as they were at Dieppe. So you can imagine that most of the stuff he was writing about, he was probably doing it kind of tongue in cheek, knowing how far he was pushing the envelope. But I think there was a backlash. I think there was, um, uh, within the intelligence community, there was a sense of honor. In other words, that you have signed the Official Secrets Act and you will take this to your grave and you will not try to cash in on it. You will not try to, you know, push the envelope. Fleming did. And as a result, I think, you know, there's a backlash. And unfortunately, that affects the historiography. And we, we, as the general public, we've kind of thrown the baby out with the bathwater in the sense that because all this myth built around Ian Fleming and Christopher Lee is another one in recent years where yeah. his exploits have been taken to a ridiculous level, which means people are now abandoning his whole service. Like, no, no, just take it back exactly. to where it was. Don't yeah. throw away what he did do, but just kind of be critical of the things that he didn't do that he said he did, because that's happened. There was that, that TV movie with Jason Connery playing Ian Fleming, where he's leading all sorts of missions himself and climbing up cliffs and yeah, yeah. things like that didn't do any good for no. the real Ian Fleming reputation. So we're in danger to say of kind of throwing away what he did do, because some of the stuff written after the war clearly was, was a bit fanciful, but yeah. Oh, yeah. A, a really important figure, but well, based on what he did, not what he didn't do. Exactly. I mean, just take a look at the screen in front of you right now. I mean, this is an important character, period, regardless of what his name is and what he did after the war. You know, anybody who holds this kind of portfolio and is trusted to this level, um, obviously has had an impact. Well, that's one of the reasons why Birch reached out to him because Fleming, of course, was the liaison uh, between himself, between Bletchley Park and um, and uh, Naval Intelligence. Now, what was happening just before Fleming gave birth um, to Ruthless was that the level of desperation in Bletchley was going off to the charts, even to the point of them suggesting what I would argue extremely irresponsible pinch uh, attempts. One of them was simply asking the Germans for, in other words, pretending to be a German ship that was floundering in the middle of the English Channel and then radioing to a local base and asking them, saying, look, there's something wrong with our Enigma, the machine, etc. Can you give us the codes, the frequencies, etc.? And hoping that they would just do this. Now, of course, when Fleming heard about this, he kind of freaked out. He said, well, you know, basically, look, we're good. We're good. Politely, he said, we're going to leave this as a last resort. Um, we're not going to go down the road to this because this will give the game away. Um, in other words, they will figure out very quickly what we are attempting to do. And that, of course, was part of the problem. You had to be able to come up with kind of pinch off or, or types of pinch operations that were not going to rebound on you. You had to give some sort of plausible denial. Um, and that was difficult because remember, this is not something that was necessarily tried and true. This is the first time that they're trying things like this on this kind of scale, let alone under the incredible pressure that they're under as well. So very much what we are seeing is the birth, as we'll see in a minute, of pinch doctrine and, of course, the development of that. It wasn't like they knew everything right away. It's kind of like any other, you know, any other weapons system that comes online um, you have the idea of what you'd like to do, and then there's a whole series of teething problems as we go, and things develop. So in this particular case, the response by Fleming to that incredible suggestion was to come up with Ruthless. And what you can see on the right is his original, 12th of September, 1940. And this is where um, basically the story ends, if you will, when it comes to the historiography. In other words, a lot of historians have seen what you see on the right, which is his initial suggestion. But because when they look at it, and then again, going back to what you said, the idea of throwing out the baby with the bathwater, 
They just assume that, no, this is just his creative mind at play, and it never got off the charts. It never got off the books. Well, let's go back to it. Number one, he's writing this to Godfrey, so his boss, the director of naval intelligence, and he says, basically, I suggest we obtain the loot by the following means. Obtain an air ministry uh, from the air ministry, an airworthy German bomber. <laughs> In brackets, they have some. I like that. Um, pick a tough crew of five, including a pilot, a wireless operator, and a word-perfect German speaker. Dress them in German Air Force uniforms, add blood and bandages to suit, crash the aircraft in the channel after making an SOS in plain language uh, to draw out a German rescue vessel carrying the kind of material they're looking to pinch. Once aboard the rescue boat, shoot the German crew, dump the bodies overboard, and bring the rescue back, uh, boat back to English port. And then, of course, the idea is to try to do this in mid-channel so you can draw the German ships out from the coast where nobody can see this go down. So you can see what he's thinking about at the beginning. He wants to be able to use surprise, so a kind of shock and awe. And then, of course, he wants to get in, capture what he needs to capture, and then figure out some sort of exfiltration, which in this particular case is about getting out without anybody being seen, i.e. sailing the boat back to a British port. But, of course, the other thing, too, is cover. And the cover he comes up with is indeed ruthless. In other words, murdering the crew, murdering prisoners of war to be able to cover up what was done. Now, a lot of times... I think this is what gives um, historians pause um, or a reason to pause and balk that this actually went in or it never went in because, of course, of the, you know, the, the highly uh, ruthless nature of it. But of course, and to get back to what, you know, you the way you intro this, when does this idea then become a plan? And within that, there's also a polishing process. So in other words, some of the awkward things like murdering the German crew would eventually be solved by other means. And I'll get to that in a couple of minutes. So what you can see on the left is Fleming's response to Birch. So after he pitches this uh, ruthless to Godfrey, Godfrey obviously gives him, you know, the go ahead. He then writes back. Uh, to Birch saying, yeah, don't worry about it. Uh, a pinch would be more likely to succeed. Meanwhile, Birch has already prepared a hit list. So basically all the boats that I showed you before, uh, Birch has sent a multi-page hit list of all the different ships that are available, what they carry, etc. So they already know. Now, here's the interesting part. And this is where we take that giant leap. And this is what's coming from the files. Now, a lot of people, like I said before, have stopped their research or at least haven't gone any further than that one piece of paper that Fleming scrawled his idea on. But indeed, if you go to the National Archives, there is a full document on Ruthless. And it is from the Air Ministry. So in other words, what we're seeing now is the birth and the spread of Ruthless. So basically, by the time Ruthless is set to go in October of 1940, um, this is who is involved. First of all, Naval Intelligence Division, obvious, and particularly the uh, Director of Naval Intelligence, John Godfrey. The First Lord uh, of the Admiralty, Dudley Pound. The Air Ministry, Secretary of Air, Kingsley Wood. The Director of Fighter Operations, John Whitworth Jones. Number 11 group under Park. Number 16th group under John Thiessen. By the way, number 11 group is the one that's doing all the heavy lifting in the Battle of Britain at this point. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine that if this gets on their docket, it's important. Um, RAF, I, and I'm not sure, and it's the RAF station. I'm not sure if you pronounce that Hawking or Hawking. I think it's Hawkins, I think. Hawkins, uh, I'm pretty sure it's Hawkins, Yeah. Coastal Command and the Fleet Air Arm, Fighter Command, RAE, which is Royal Aviation Establishment, I think it is, at Farnborough, and the Ministry of Aircraft Production under Lord Beaverbrook. As a matter of fact, and of course, Secretary of War, I, have, I actually 
put him down there twice. Not that he's. But that's a bit of a that's a bit of a who's who of of anybody who's anybody in 1940 UK. I mean, th th yeah, this yeah isn't exactly. Just two, random two starters minutes. in a pub. This this is this is involving no. some top. Top, in the end of the Raiders are lost last star where they go some top people. This is top people, isn't it? It is. And you can see that basically we've got the chain of command, how all this is going to flow. So in between the September, you know, the early September, you know, uh, 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 proposal, by the time we get to October, this has actually taken on a life of its own where the Navy is actively cooperating with the Air Force, because the Air Force also sees the benefits in this, mm. because a lot of the ships that are some of the ships that are going out are air sea rescue ships, which have two Enigma machines, one Naval, one Air Force. So they see it within their direct interest to be able to get involved with this. And not to mention, it goes right up to the cabinet. Is As a matter of fact, it's Lord Beaverbrook, who is the one who provides the captured German aircraft. So basically what you have is you have permission that is given right at the top for this operation. So this isn't just a question of Fleming and his creative mind pulling something out of his butt. Um, this is, you know, perhaps that's where it started, but now it is starting to grow to say the least. Now, the other thing we should take a look at is force allocation for the raid. So this is what the air ministry provides. The air ministry will provide the captured German HE-111, the Henkel 111. It is going to be, um, originally it's going to be painted up in, um, in uh, British colors, RAF colors, because they have to fly it from Farnborough to Hawkinge before the operation can start. But it's gonna be covered with a light wash that will be removed to then have it blend in with the German bomber stream. And that's the idea. The idea is to get it up in the German bomber stream when one of the bombers, when one of the bombing raids is heading back. And then, of course, that's when the Trojan horse play will go into effect. The air ministry will also provide the aerodromes, the base facilities, and the ground staff for this. They will provide the pilot who, according to Fleming, he wants him to be, quote, tough, a bachelor, experienced in flying, speaks German, able to swim, and a marksman. So very interesting. And, and when, the more I read this, it more rem, uh, reminds me of those Alistair McLean books that we used to read when we were kids and, you know, Force 10 from Navarone and things like this. And, you know, as much as you want to simply say that, yeah, this is Hollywood going crazy, you re realize that, no, this is actually real for 1940. This is actually going into effect. The other thing they're going to provide, of course, will be the German uniforms, the rubber boats, the May Wests that they're going to be using, the rubber boat, the raft that they're going to be using, the um, uh, recognition signals equipment, very lights, and smoke flares to simulate uh, damage to the aircraft and why they need to ditch. Now, the Navy is going to provide the navigator, who's supposed to be you know, equal to the pilot. They're going to provide a motor torpedo boat engineer uh, to steer the captured vehicle, uh, excuse me, vessel, um, a German speaker, basically to go through the material to be pinched or for interrogations, and then one various, which I assume would be the extra muscle on board. So in other words, you always need one guy who was willing to do the dirty work. Um, Stanley Baker character from the guns of Navarone. Exactly, yeah, 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 exactly. No, no, no particular talent other than the muscle. Um, and then, of course, the small arms. Each man was to have two revolvers, which is interesting, grenades and a submachine gun. So they were they were packing quite a punch. And, of course, there would be one motor torpedo bo boat off uh, for rescue if required. And, by the way, there was also a reconnaissance aircraft, which I forgot to add to the list, that was going to play a huge role in this. So immediately you can see the cast of characters involved. And of course, more importantly, the force allocation is much more serious than we ever expected and much more extensive. Now, just a bit of a sidebar for those people out there who are geeking on captured equipment, uh, kind of like myself at times. Uh, the HE-111 was uh, 6853. It came from KG-26, which is a very famous uh, German um, uh, squadron. It was apparently damaged by a Spitfire over the Firth of Forth in February of 1940, and it was forced to land at North Berwick, North Berwick Law. 
So as a result, it had been a recent, it was recently acquired in the last six months. And apparently there were a few more of them um, uh, than just this particular one around, which was fascinating. But you can imagine that they weren't necessarily um, too numerous. So the fact that they were willing to give one up for an operation like this lends uh, more support to the idea of just how desperate and how important an operation like this was. But I think the real evidence, and this is the fascinating part, is the actual form. This is the play-by-play -play of how this was all to go down. So basically, a recce aircraft would be sent up at night. The idea was to go out into the channel and locate the potential prey. Um, and if they couldn't necessarily find one, they would try to then create conditions to get one out. But that was going to be tough. So the idea was to go around. They knew where, generally speaking, the patrolled boats operated because it was basically a grid square pattern and they would be in one of the grids. It was just a question of being in the right grid at the right time. So a recce aircraft would go out while the bomber, the captured German bomber, was ferried from Farnborough to RAF Hawkinge. And it was being escorted at that time by a couple of Spitfires. Um, while that was going on, or as that was going on, they would land at Hawkinge. The crew, which was still dressed in British uniforms, would then, of course, use the codename Ruthless. And the Hawkinge, which had been uh, notified before, would then go under tight security. And so basically they would have, the crew would have their own room. They would get changed into the German uniforms. They would load onto the plane, take everything they needed. The wash was then, you know, stripped off and the German uh, markings were, were, were touched up. And then, of course, at dawn, if they had spotted a victim or a potential victim, then, of course, they would take off. And at this particular point is the bomb. One of the reasons why they wanted it done at dawn was because they assumed that this would be the end of the patrol cycle for the vessel that they were trying to pinch the material off of. And the crew would be tired at this point. So they're even thinking down to that level. In other words, how will the crew be when we arrive? The other thing that's absolutely fascinating, and this is probably the most, I would argue, one of the most significant pieces of evidence, is that the airspace all along the Dover coast from Foreland to Hastings is cleared for this operation. Now, you have to understand that this is the height of the Battle of Britain, and they are blocking off airspace from fighter command so they can put this operation into effect. Let that sink in for a bit. That, that absolutely, if nothing else, shows how important this was considered. I mean, as we, it goes yeah. back to that precarious nature of where the Allies are in 1940, that they're considering clearing everything on for, for this. It's, I mean, okay, we, we'll go to the web, the fact it doesn't happen, but the fact that we're even considering this. I mean, we know the arguments yeah. happened later in the war about who gets the use of bomber command on certain days. People were very, very protective of not uh, and didn't want to lose their force to another to another a task for even a few hours. So this is this is this is big. Yeah, and especially traditionally, you tend to see the squabbling in between the navy and the air force or the army. You don't see it here, which means that they are suitably impressed with yeah. the importance of this operation. Not to mention there is probably some top-down pressure for them all to play nice and to get this done. Well, the idea being that once they clear this, the bomber then will spot the target. It will pick up the target and hopefully as far from the French coast as possible. At that particular point, the pilot is going to cut one of the engines. He's going to issue the distress call. He's going to lose height rapidly, and they're going to light up the smoke flares to simulate that they have damage in one of their engines and they're about to crash. And then, of course, at this point, the recce aircraft, which had spotted the prey originally, is going to hover above temporarily and going to shadow everything as it's going down. Then, of course, the bomber is going to pancake onto the water. The crew is going to scramble into their raft. The other thing that they considered um, was the fact that they wanted the plane to sink quickly because the last thing they wanted it to do was to continue to float because then there was a possibility that the rescue vessel would call out a salvage vessel. And now suddenly you've got more eyes on the, you know, in, in the area, more witnesses, and you didn't want that. 
So they were quite conscious, uh, uh, conscious, uh, sorry, they were quite aware of the fact that they needed to uh, sink the ship, the sink mm. the aircraft quickly, right? So the bomber, of course, was rigged uh, to avoid calls for salvage. The bomber crew then, of course, paddles across. And, you know, it kind of reminds me of that scene from, was it U571? Yeah, where they're yeah. paddling across pretending to be German. Well, that's exactly where I, I'm assuming that's where they got this idea from was coming from Ruthless, where they're going to paddle and they're going to be, you know, waving to the guys on board, to, you know, on board the rescue vessel to take them on. Of course, they're dressed like a German crew. They're hiding their weapons. And then, of course, at just as they're about to get on board, the recce aircraft will come down and dive in a faux attack on the rescue vessel to draw the attention of the crews. In other words, instead of having their guns trained on these guys, if they were, they would now be looking skyward, and i.e. their attention would be deflected from the crew. This then gives the opportunity for the uh, commandos to be able to board the ship and pull out their guns, etc., and then go into action. So you can see the kind of coordination. And then, of course, once that was done, there were different types of if it was successful and if it wasn't. So basically, to cover this up, if it was successful, they were to subdue the crew. By the way, um, and I'll allude to it again, um, as far as we can see, they did not opt for the murder option. As a matter of fact, they decided they were going to use tear gas. They were going to use tear gas to help subdue the crew and then take them prisoner. So, so there's clear, a clear example of the original memo by Ian Fleming by being refined, modified and improved as it goes to the next stages. Because we were talking with Eric Lee on Monday about Operation Foxley and the, the SOE plan to kill Hitler, but it never got beyond that first stage. So there are complete holes in it. Like the, the guy they were going to send in, they had in mind to be the assassin had terrible eyesight, which you you would assume would have been yeah. kind of corrected if it went to the next stage. You know, so in this well, in this thing, we we are seeing that the original memo clearly had some moral questions over it, which they kind of addressed by this stage. Yeah, they certainly did, and so and you can see this with all types of planning. I mean, we see it in Dieppe. Um, get an example with Dieppe would be the tanks. In other words, at first they thought, well, we want to pull off the pinch. We'll put the tanks on the flanks. Well, wait a second. We, they have to cross rivers. Bridges can be blown. They'll never get into the town quickly. Okay, well, we'll run right down the middle. Okay, fine. And that was done very quickly. You know, so sometimes, you know, when you come up with an idea, you don't have all the details worked out immediately. It takes a little bit of that process, right? And that's exactly what we're seeing here. We're seeing the outcome of a process. So again, this is not just, you know, Fleming writing something on a cocktail napkin in a pub one day. It may have started that way, but now it has gone through a proper planning process. Well, if it was not successful, the idea was to be basically, and it, if the commandos had been captured, they also had a story. And again, this goes back to almost like Force 10 from Navarone, where basically it was done by a lark of hotheads who decided they wanted to steal the plane and basically get into action because things were too boring for them at home. Whether the Germans would have believed that or not is another story, but at least this is what they were attempting. If they all stick to that story, it's it's for the Germans to prove it's not. Even if they doubt it, they've got to prove it isn't the truth. They've got to, they've got to come up with a viable alternative. If they all stick to this, no, no, it's just a laugh. We were drunk. You know, if, yeah, exactly. It, it may be ridiculous, but if they stick to it and they've all been briefed on this, the exactly. Germans can't really argue with it. And in hindsight, we know what they're after, and we know the incredible importance of what they're after. The Germans may not necessarily understand that, you know, mm. at that time. Do they understand that something like Bletchley Park exists and desperately yeah. needs this kind? No, they don't. They don't understand that at that time. So there is an indication, or there's always a possibility that they could say, okay, well, why the hell would they want to do this, you know, if this was a, you know, a, a, a directed operation? But, you know, trying to put the pieces together. So a story like this, although it seems bizarre in hindsight, likely would have worked or at least would have had a degree of success at that time. Now, I should say the results. We have been talking about operations that never happened. Well, a bit of surprise for you, Woody. It did happen. 
And this is the fascinating part. It actually went in, not once, but twice. And you can see it up here. It was postponed simply because they didn't find the suitable prey. But indeed, they sent out the um, they sent out the reconnaissance aircraft looking for prey. Fleming and the crew made it to Hawkinge, and they were ready to go at a moment's notice. So, <clears throat> in this particular case, it actually did go in. It just wasn't successful. And you can right. see it here on October 16th. This is a message from Fleming. And it's Operation Ruthless postponed. Two reconnaissance flights by Coastal Command reveal no suitable craft operating at night. And evidence from wireless is also negative. Suggest material and organization should not be dispersed. Possibly Portsmouth area, Portsmouth area may be more fruitful. Uh, Fleming returns to Admiralty today. Wow. So now we can see that this was actually implemented and it was actually implemented again later on. But the fallout of this, of course, was incredible because what you see in the middle was uh, Birch's response where he talks about Alan Turing and Peter Twin, two of his lead cryptographers who come in and feeling cheated like an undertaker would when they didn't get a nice corpse to work on. In other words, they have, you know, they've been sinking so much time and effort into this. They crossed their fingers that this pinch operation was going to work. And now they can't find a target. Um, they feel, uh, Bletchley Park feels, that, they're, that, naval, uh, that naval intelligence and the Air Ministry and the Admiralty are not doing the utmost, even though they are. And so that, that desperation is ramped up another notch. And of course, Fleming at the bottom is reassuring Birch that he has no need to fear that the value of a pinch being underestimated. Now, the sequel to this actually happens right after. This is when Birch then suggests yet another operation, not necessarily Ruthless 2.0, but very close. And the idea is now to switch and target one particular craft that works out of Dieppe. And that is the Bernard von Chersky, which is an air sea rescue tender, which has both Luftwaffe and Kriegsmarine Enigma on board. And you can see here, he's talking about the, the uh, postponement on practical grounds of Ruthless, but now they're starting to move into a more sophisticated form. And part of it, of course, is they're going to use, instead of aircraft, what they want to use are French chasseurs, free French chasseurs, which take part in the Dieppe operation later on. And they want a German or French speaker on board to then be able to fox the enemy and get them close. So they'll be able to pull off a pinch operation instead of landing from, you know, pancaking on the, uh, on the water in an aircraft. They're going to pretend that they have a stricken vessel that is actually German when in reality it's not. And they're going to pull off or attempt to pull off the same Trojan horse play as well. So as far as we know, that did not go in. But you could see that they are suggesting a similar operation to Ruthless. They're going to um, go after the Bernard von Chersky. This is what they expect to find. Naval Enigma, Air Enigma, plus, of course, the German Naval Code and the CNOT Code. And then, of course, here is where they expect to find it. These are usually along the coast, moving between Dieppe, Cherbourg, and Brest. Again, I will stress that since 1940, they have been building up their targeting um, of pinch, uh, pinch opportunities or pinch targets in this entire area, which is the home of the second German 2nd Defense Division um, for the Kriegsmarine. They also, of course, suggest that maybe they use the Schiff 26, which had been recently captured. It was a German raider. And they were even thinking and suggesting of using that as a way to fox the Germans. In other words, sail that in. They even knew the name of the captain of the Bernard von Chersky. So they were going to use his name to create the kind of false confidence they would need to be able to close quickly to be able to affect the pinch operation. And of course, here at the bottom, tear gas, of course, is going to be employed again. And a surprise attack would prevent um, basically the removal of the plugs. Again, it goes back to what I talked about before, the idea of if you can get a machine, the machine itself isn't going to necessarily give you what you need, 
unless you can get it in the in its pristine form the way is it is set up to work on that day that could be gold for them now of course out of all that you see the develop of a pinch doctrine something that of course you know um, I, I revealed in my book um, pinch by chance, pinch by opportunity, and pinch by design. Pinch by chance, of course, you stumble across something in the middle of operation. It looks pretty good. Pick it up. Pinch by opportunity, meaning that you have an operation that's already planned that is likely going to bring in to, you know, into view what you want. Be ready for it. And then what we see with Ruthless and what we see with a whole bunch of other operations are pinches by design. In other words, we have a certain problem that we need to fix therefore create a raid that is going to not only provide the vehicle but also the cover the plausible deniability and go and get it and then of course this was what we see at the beginning of um uh ruthless which basically is the uh, the the nascent form of pinch doctrine which is surprise shrapnel and boarding as birch had suggested in the summer of 1940 because of course everything was a race against time because as soon as the germans feel that they are going to be captured they are going to go into their standard operating procedure of destroying whatever is considered to be vital including cryptographic material um, the idea is not destructive firepower but suppressive firepower the thunderclap and then of course an infiltration exfiltration route to get in and get out and then, of course, the covering up of it all, the destruction of the particular area, the feeding of a particular line to the press. Um, you know, so in other words, you didn't capture a boat, you sank the German boat to be able to, you know, to assuage any kind of uh, any kind of uh, suspicion on the part of the Germans. And then if necessary, heavy casualties can be incurred. And then, of course, the li list of pinch operations after um, after Ruthless uh, was Operation Claymore, the first Lafoten Islands raid, which was highly successful. And one of the reasons why they ended up doing it up there was because now they didn't have to worry about luring their prey out uh, or they didn't have to worry about chasing their prey. That was one of the big problems. The idea was if you hit a port, you have several areas and it's a very target rich environment. You have the ships which are corralled in the harbor. They can't get away. Each one of them carries a machine and the material that you need. You also have a naval headquarters, which will also have the material, and a supply depot, which likely will have the material that is set to be distributed to the vessels, and that will be stored for months on end. So on the ships, you might be able to get the key sheets for the current month and the next month. Naval headquarters, maybe a couple of months. Supply depot, six months to a year in advance because this stuff isn't printed out on a daily basis. It's printed in bulk and then it's stored for distribution. So if you can find that, and then of course, after that in the summer of 1940, uh, 41, there's a series of them, almost a dozen pinch operations that are done out in sea following the sinking of the Bismarck. This tips the Germans off though, that something is up because of the pattern. And then of course the Germans start bringing in or accelerating the four rotor enigma, they, the Allies go back to Lofoten at the end of the year, hoping that they're going to be able to find something on the four rotor, and they don't. And then, of course, Operation Chariot and Operation Mermiden were supposed to be twin operations carried out within 24 hours of each other. Uh, it makes sense that, you know, that Chariot, the raid on St. Nazaire, would have been a, a pinch by opportunity, to say the least, if not design, because you're hitting a U-boat base and you're targeting U-boats, plus the headquarters. And of course, Mermiden, which a lot of people tend to forget because it was scuttled at the last moment when they reached the estuary off of Bayonne and couldn't get in because of a sandbar, that basically that was the forerunner to Dieppe. They were actually pulling off the almost the exact same uh, raid that they were going to pull off at Dieppe in June, which was then postponed to August. And then of course, Operation Jubilee, Dieppe. And that pretty much from what I can see, kind of ends these big pinch operations uh, for several reasons. One, Dieppe is an absolute disaster, as we know. Um, and even though the concept of the pinch remains very strong, um, the need for it goes away because by the time we get to October, a pinch by chance has actually solved the four rotor problem. So you can see here that there is a lot more to Operation Ruthless than just a simple, you know, cocktail uh napkin yeah. kind of 
everything that's going and on. A couple of questions for you. First is, sure. is it complete coincidence that Ruthless and Rutter, the, the early Diet plan, that they have the first scene, three letters? Is there any connection? Or is that just me <laughs> seeing something? That not that I know of, but we could start a conspiracy theory right now. It, it's, worth, it's worth a discussion apart. And the other thing I'm, I was, it got me thinking is the museum in Aaron Morse, bear with me, it'll make sense this. Yeah. They, they always have in the, the, about the memo that Churchill said about a harbour and then beside it is the model of the artificial harbour. So you have the question and you have the end result, but you don't show the workings out. And I think what, what we are left with in history is we often don't have the workings out. We have, yeah, yes. Ian Fleming's original idea is kind of, as you say, well published. Historians have dismissed it, talked about it, whatever. And we kind of leads right up to your work with Diet. But all this um, evolution of planning, all these stages it goes to, they tend to kind of get overlooked. And the, the, mm -hmm. the fact is, it's really interesting. The fact, you know, that, that list of, you know, at Keith Park and, and all these other people there, this, a lot of people involved in this. And, and in the end, they did kind of solve that moral question by, by planning to use tear gas and subdue and capture as opposed to the the, the, the killing of, which is a, 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 the obvious thing you notice in that first memo is that, you know, we're the British. We're not going to be winning the war that way, surely. Well, I mean, it's also the, you know, the summer of 1940 and surrender looks like it's a possibility. I mean, you are at the most desperate moment, I would argue, in the history of the British Empire. So, you know, leaning towards something like that, I don't necessarily think at first probably lit people up the way we are being lit up by it. They probably kind of thought, yeah, OK, no problem. Um, but then afterwards, they realized, well, wait a second. Now we're sort of getting into a territory that we don't really want to get into unless we're absolutely pushed to do. Is there an alternative? Yes, there is. OK, let's pursue that. But yeah, you're right. And I think the other thing, too, is I think it gives you a, a good idea of how the existence of combined operations and what combined operations is up to needs to be reassessed. Because originally, Ruthless was proposed to combined operations when it first got going under Roger Keyes. And Roger Keyes said no to it because it was too small. In other words, it was too small for his operations. So it's not hard to see how things developed and changed differently, you know, as, as it went on, starting with Lofoten and going all the way through 1941 and into 42. Um, also, combined operations becomes the only delivery vehicle capable of pulling off pinch operations because the Brits are on the defensive everywhere and they're not coming into contact like they would be later in the war, post 1940, late 42, early 43, where they're overrunning German positions and can scoop up the material. They're on the defensive. They have to be proactive. The only way you can be proactive is either pulling off, you know, ruthless, a series of ruthless operations or broadening it out where you're killing X amount of, you know, birds with various stones, you know, with one stone. And that's basically what uh, combined operations does. So, you know, if I, and I've said this before, if I had a grad student, I'd be pushing him or her to do a major reassessment of combined operations you know, during this period, because there's oh, a definitely. lot. More. And, and, and a lot. I think we would need to, as a, as a historical world, to understand a kind of a new system, system of measurement of success. When we've talked about some of these commando missions with various guests over the years, and you look at it and you go, what did it achieve? We haven't got a sort of a recognized scale to measure that stuff again. With conventional military operations, we can say, you know, did we reach the river? Yes or no. Did we take the hill? Yes or no. You can kind of define what it was supposed to yeah. achieve and you can you can quantify it and say, yes, we did or we didn't. But with some of these 40, 41 things, there's all the propaganda element. There's the morale. There's the, the sending a message. There's intelligence. There's a whole plethora of reasons why some of these raids can be judged beyond just like the, the, the aqueduct in Italy one that we talked about with Neil Cherry, for example. I mean, it seems to be an unmitigated disaster, but at mm -hmm. the same time, it sets into foundation a, 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 an idea, a concept. It sends a message that you know what commandos can be taken to places and do things that can put the fear of God in the enemy. So it, you need to look at these things in some big sense of a uh, con contextual sense. And it need, it will need someone to really unravel all this stuff yeah. and give us a new way of defining that period. I think. Well, I think, yeah. And one, and to be completely incendiary at the moment, um, <laughs> take a look at chariot, the raid on Satan is there. Is it as 
great of a success as we have been led to believe. And I say that not taking away from anybody who was there and the bravery of anybody, but when you weigh it, what is more important, blowing a dry dock that may be used to house the turpits, just maybe on the off chance it sorties yeah. out, as opposed to breaking naval enigma. You know what I mean? That's yeah. what St. Nazaire offers you. You're hitting a U-boat base with U-boats there. You're targeting the U-boats. You're targeting naval headquarters. You're not just doing that for command control and destructive purposes. You're, you're there to pick stuff up as well. Wow. So that's why we need to take a look. And I think Operation Chariot, just on it in of itself, particularly when you understand that Mermiden was actually a twin raid that was specifically for pinch purposes, it appears, I would argue, even though I don't see the direct evidence there as of yet, that it, it certainly appears that there was much more to Chariot than we've ever known. No, definitely. And I think, you know, we're in that era where we are supposedly trying to analyze things like you know the dam busters raid for example has been been subject to um reappraisal re analysis yeah. over the years and i think it's time we took some of these well you know dieppe for the canadians we've discussed it is you know it's on some pedestal of importance with the whole country's you know identity and yeah. kind of poking this fragile house of cards of what it means the canadians as you have found out is 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 you know can be tri tricky. And I think things yeah. like um, San Nazaire, they have this mystique, they have this sense yeah. of pride, along with the Dan Buster's Ray, along with Arnhem, all those things that they become, they become bigger than themselves. They become mythological. Um, Comfortable old slippers. Yeah. And it's, yeah. You know, I, I really look forward to the next era when we can, people younger than us will be investigating this. I'm going to do one question from Scott Grimwood before we end this. Sure. And this is, um, was there any consideration of trying to grab an Enigma and code books from a German ship in a neutral harbor? Not that I know of, Scott. Um, I have never seen anything in there. doesn't mean they didn't. I know during, before the war they were attempting pinch operations, but they were doing them in uh, embassies and consulates. And there was a lot of stuff that was going on there. As a matter of fact, um, the Germans kind of knew what was going on everybody kind of knew that you know your your consulates and your embassies would be targets as a matter of fact that's the way the british were able to sell cape matapan to the italians and the germans in other words it wasn't just code breaking it was a spy who was in uh who had penetrated i think it was the italian consulate in the states or the italian embassy in washington somehow penetrated. Ah, but that was the, the the film sea wolves with the um the uh, yeah. calcutta light horse going in but that was the target uh they were using a, a ship in a neutral harbor to give information to you but i don't know there would have been enigma on there i suppose but that i don't well, i've so, got a book on that but i don't remember that enigma ever being mentioned in the book there but that but book see, is 30 40 years old so yeah it, it, well, it, well one of the problems of course and this is the problem that came up with with uh, ruthless it was if it was too narrow in focus it was likely going to give the Germans an indication of what you were up to. Yeah. You know? So as a result, you know, we start to broaden it out. And I know in 1943, the British actively um, got involved with a Canadian pinch operation. There was a, an escaped U-boat commander who was trying to escape and rendezvous off of the Gaspé coast with a U-boat. And the Canadians thought, oh, my God, this is wonderful. We get a chance to trap a U-boat and we can pinch the material off the U-boat. Well, when the Brits found out about this, particularly the Admiralty in Bletchley Park, they said, well, wait, 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 you're not doing this because we're already into four rotor. You do this and it may give the game away. So they actually scuttled right at the last moment. They scuttled the pinch operation and they just basically, you know, caught the U-boat uh, commander and returned him to the prisoner, camp, prisoner of war camp but they didn't try the pinch operation. So sometimes things like that could be called off at the moment. There's also the possibility of deception operations put on and whatever else. So. Well, yeah, I just checked while you were talking there, the book boarding party about the raid into Goa yeah. uh, was published in 1978. So Ooh. and I, to the best of my knowledge, I've got it on my shelf. I don't think anyone's written anything on that since then. So that's obviously prior the release of tons and tons of documents. So there's another potential story. I know that was yeah. 43. So this is after the emergency of needing Enigma, but it's ah, still okay. It still it still has a relevance. I mean, there is an operation that probably deserves a bit more analysis as to what was going on and what the actual objectives of that were. Because when you look at it now, it seems yeah. a bit 
a bit vague and tenuous. But anyway, that's another subject for the day. We will bring things to an end, and we can't wait to have you back on again but uh, on a future show. But for, for the viewers, what are you working on now? Obviously, you're busy teaching. It's 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 oh, yeah. season for a professor. But any projects you're working on right now? Yeah, I'm working on a few things. I mean, I'm trying to get my next book finished, which is all about a, a Canadian and British air crew um, that go missing, and it's called Missing Presumed Dead. But uh, right now, with combination of COVID and a combination of trying to get access to some top secret files, which are still classified, and I'm trying to push for their release. Um, originally, we were looking at a release date of this year, then it was pushed off till 2023, and now it might be 2024, just because of everything that's going on. But either way, I still have a manuscript I have to deliver. So I'm working on that and uh, just preparing for the Dieppe tour. I'm going to be uh, doing a Dieppe tour with Jane Colton Turvey for the 80th anniversary, and that's coming up this summer. My other ones that were supposed to go, we've delayed them for one year just because of the fighting that's going on in Ukraine and, of course, the pandemic, which is lingering on. It just made much more sense just to do it when everybody can be healthy and happy um, the following year, uh, at least for coming across the pond. And, uh, yeah, that's it. Ongoing research and, you know, sparring with people on Twitter and all different things. And Yeah, well, we all do that. And uh, I, may, I may just pop up the road to Dieppe and join you in August to, 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 so we can actually meet in per person and have be a nice. beer. That would be quite nice. Only a couple yeah. of hours up the road for me. Uh, I'll, I'll think about doing that. But, yeah, it's been great talking to you, David. So I'll just see mine, yeah. folks, we've got coming up later. I'll come back and say goodbye in a second. So, as I said, that's the first of our double bill. Kyle Glover is joining us at 7 p.m. UK time to talk about the mission into Crete to kidnap. A German general, you may have known it from the Dirk Bogard film, Ill Met by Moonlight, but we'll talk about that. That brings SOE in, it brings intelligence, it brings all sorts of things. So Kyle, who's a regular visitor to Crete and who is one half of the History Rage podcast, will be joining us for his second visit tonight. So as usual, don't forget to like the shows you're watching. Consider becoming a patron or a YouTube member. Use the links in the description below, the links to David's book. I'll hold it up one more time. Although it is primarily about Dieppe, it does have a chapter about this, what we've been talking about today and it covers all this Prince Raid uh, concept. It talks about Ian Fleming uh, and all these other people we've talked about today in greater detail. So if you haven't got it already, what are you waiting for? But right now, I'll bring David back in, basically to say good good, good day. Have a good day teaching, and we will see you again next time. So uh, well, Thank you, Woody, and thanks for everybody coming along. All the um, usual yeah. suspects. Yep, they've all been there. So cheers, everybody. This is Paul Woodard for World War II TV. I'll see you again tonight. Cheers, everybody. Bye. <laughs>